Touchdown, UCLA! With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Zyrood. On the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. What's going on, beautiful people? Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, Santa Barbara, wherever you are tuning in to the L.A. Football Show, we are live on the AM, the mightier 1090. You can always find us on the L.A. Football Network, the Believe Podcast Network, YouTube, at LAFB Network, everywhere you get your podcasts. We are. I'm your host, Ryan Dyer, and I am pumped on this Friday. After a huge Rams win. I know it was ugly, but hey, wins and losses don't care how it look. You don't get style points in the NFL. All of us on podcasts and radio and media love to uh, give out style points and power rankings and wins and losses don't care. Rams are four and one, you know, one and one against the division. So. Big win. I'm going to get all into that. Joined by my buddy Sosa Cremendez. He's the host of Locked On Rams, also a fantasy writer for Pro Football Focus. Awesome dude. So he's going to jump on with me to talk about this Rams game. And then we've got three other LA football games coming to you this weekend. You got the uh, Utah Utes going to the Collie to play our Trojans. See if the Trojans can keep that momentum that they built in a Solid win over Colorado. We'll call it a a beatdown, if you will. And then UCLA, after a bad loss against ASU, travels out to Tempe to play the other school in Arizona, the University of Arizona, in what should be a a good rebound game. It's football. Anyone could beat anyone, but this is a game UCLA should dominate and get back to basics and get back in the win column and hopefully turn their season back to what it was after week two when there was a lot of hope and promise. Now there's a lot of clouds, a lot of doubt, a lot of disdain, a lot of questioning whether this team's any good or not. I still believe they are. And they got away from their roots against Arizona. They gave up way too many gash plays. Basically five plays accounted for all of ASU's touchdowns or points, I should say. And like 90% of their yards came on five plays. Easier said than done. Cut those out. This UCLA team's right back to where they were after that LSU win. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then our Chargers, big win on Monday night. Doesn't get any easier as the Cleveland Browns roll to town. How weird is that to say? 2021 and 2020 have shown us a lot of odd things in this world. You know, pandemic, a lot of stuff going on culturally, socially. Maybe the weirdest, and this is jokingly, obviously, because there's bigger issues in our world, but saying the schedule gets harder because the Cleveland Browns come to town. Good for that organization finally turning things around, but they got a good squad, man. Um, So we're going to get into that as well and see what this Chargers team needs to do to keep rolling and get to four and one and keep their lead in the AFC and kind of create a lead in the AFC. Well, keep their lead in the AFC West and begin creating a lead and dominance in the entire AFC because beating the Browns would do that. Again, weird to say. So we're going to get all of that. Show is always brought to you by betonline.ag. Wherever you are in the Southland, head to betonline.ag.com. Betonline.ag. You can just end it there. Backslash if you want. Plenty of prop bets if you want to win some extra money this weekend. They got the best lines, the best spreads. You can bet on basically anything. They still got MVP voting up. Herbert and Stafford continue to rise in that. So if you haven't put money on them yet, you need to now before, you know, you're not going to win anything. Kyler Murray, the favorite right now. Herbert and Stafford are like third. You know, you could have put money on it. You could have put money on Herbert to start the year. And his odds were fantastic. You would have won some big money because he's playing at an MVP caliber. Not as much now, but hey, you can still go do it. Or at least parlay some games this weekend. That's what I do. You know, pick three or four games, parlay them. Win 50 bucks here and there. You know, we do it for fun. Bet online at AG. You're going to get a welcome bonus as well when you sign up. That's free money you can play with and use for all your betting needs. Bet online at AG. Tell them the guys at the LA Football Network sent you. All right. Beautiful Friday. Hope everyone's having a good commute, a good time working from home. Hopefully, you're done working now. The weekend is here. 
football is upon us. We had a great game kickoff, though, last night at Lumen Field in Seattle. Highlighter green, bone white, bone, I guess. We'll just call it bone. Highlighter green, Seattle. We got the bone for the Rams. Let's get into it. Here's my guy, Sosa Cremendous. Rams fans, whoo, we made it through, snuck one out, but hey, it's a division game, ugly wins are still wins, it doesn't matter in the win column, and it, uh, to talk all about it with me, joining me on the LA Football Show right here on the AM, the Mightier 1090 and the LA Football Podcast on the LA Football Network, he's been on, he's a recurring guest, he's one of the best Rams follows out there, Sosa Cremendez, host of Locked On Rams, also fantasy football writer for Pro Football Focus. Big Sos, what's up, brother? How you doing, man? I'm doing well, brother. Thanks for having me on. It was uh, a long night, tumultuous, really. My uh, emotions were <laughs> up, down, up, down. Uh, very weird game, but like you said, you, you know, sometimes you got to win ugly, and I think that's kind of the mark of a good team, right, is when things don't go your way, as long as you can still get out of there with a win, um, you like to you like to do that at least. So now they got that mini buy, you know, 10 days to sort mm -hmm. of relax, try to get healthy. Yeah. Of course, there was a lot of injuries, so we'll see where they go from here. But um, that schedule gets a lot easier now, so that's obviously a good thing for this team. Yeah, I think overall making it through this stretch four and one, you got to be happy. But were you on the mic right after the game? I mean, were you just, I mean, you locked on. You guys are always locked on. Were you on the mic right away? We're locked on. I was right on the mic. Yeah, it was, um, it, it's both a good thing, obviously, uh, because everything's still fresh in your mind. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't really got to think back, but um it's tough too right uh, especially in those night games it's like you're east they don't coast. finish yeah they don't finish until you know midnight and i'm on the east coast and then i gotta record i gotta edit by the time everything's out oh, and i'm yeah. done i would think i think i finished at like 2 two fifteen, something like that last night so long night yeah. for me you're a warrior yeah i mean i'm in la <laughs> and the night games happen and i'm like it's 8 30 i'm like should i just do this in the morning like it's getting late <laughs> yeah and you're there 12 30 like all right let's bang this out so well done man yeah it's it's easier when they win, right? Like if it was a loss, yeah. probably would have been a little bit upset, but you know, they mm -hmm. made it a little bit easier last night. Totally. So before we get into it, speaking of man of the people, I got to ask you, cause you got, you know, you're a podcaster. We're in this together. You got some, I don't know if you call it hate respect. What for the, for that beautiful white backdrop you got behind you. I see you haven't, you haven't folded. You haven't gone and got any posters or anything like that. What went through your mind when someone's calling you out for the white backdrop? I think it looks great. It's, it's, it's a classy look. I was a little bit sad because I worked hard to rearrange this room to get this white background. There used to be a squat rack behind me. I don't know if you yeah. remember when I would hop on. Uh, so that took a lot of work. Uh, but now joking aside, you know, I, I just tried to keep it as plain as possible because for me, it was like, I'm all about substance. I'm not about like the look of things, you know, yeah. and I, I know most people aren't like that. I mean, you even look at football. A lot of fans don't care what happens on the field. They're like, what's the logo? What's the jersey? What's the sock color? That's not me. I just yeah. want to see someone sling a ball and someone hit someone hard. So uh, for me, it's like, you know, some, as long as someone's talking, give us, giving us that um, content, it, it would be okay. But no, joking aside, I'll throw something up there eventually. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, it's just tough to figure out because the, the height level is not that high yeah. here. Uh, and I just don't really know what, what I want to put up. So kind of still figuring it out. Yeah, it's, yeah, you know, it, it's a science to figure out what the backdrop. I mean, they're always in my... You know, my daughter's room, as you know, or back now I'm back home visiting my folks. And my dad's office was this is a better backdrop, little like books and studies, yeah, really like very that. studious, like Anchorman, like mahogany and leather bound <laughs> books. But yeah, anyway. you look wise. You look yeah. wise. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> uh, speaking of jerseys, though, I mean, we had the Battle of the Bone and Royal and the Highlighter Green. I mm. saw on Twitter a lot, everyone going back and forth about the jerseys, like who's got the uglier jerseys. Are you in on the bone jerseys yet? I, I, I like the bone jerseys. Are you on them yet? I like them too. Um, last year, I loved them. This year, yeah. I think I adjusted a little bit when they got the new white ones. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe the bone aren't as good as I thought. or um, But I still like them. Like I think yeah. they look better than the blue tops. And it really just depends on what they're wearing uh, in terms of the pants because it kind of changes the, the look of it. But um, I personally like them. You know, I don't got a problem with them. I think they're still kind of unique. And I like that like off white type of color. Yeah, I think it's great. It's it's LA, so you want to be a little different. And mm -hmm. you know, in my prom group, do you guys have prom out in Canada? That's probably a we dumb do, question. Yeah. <laughs> we do. Yeah, we do. I feel bad even asked that now. But anyway, in my prom, 
our group, all of our group was wearing white suits. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go with the ivory, the, the off white eggshell suit. So I, mm-hmm. I feel like I can relate to that bone, that bone look. So, um, but anyway, so, so let's get into the game. So the Rams come out, look a little flat. Were you, re- let me just start with that. Were you surprised that after the debacle against Arizona getting blown out by then, they still looked rusty coming out. Stafford still looked off. Just there wasn't that quite that momentum or that, um, I guess that Christmas that you would expect after a bad loss. But then again, only four days. I don't even think they put the pads on all week. McVay said it was basically just classroom work. Were you surprised by that? Or was that to be expected? And then they would get it going as the game went on. You know, I was a little bit surprised. Um, Maybe I shouldn't have been, like you said, obviously it's hard, you know, when you're traveling on the road on a short week, going from divisional rival to another game with another divisional rival. Mm -hmm. Uh, It can't be easy. Right. So I give them a lot of credit for at least bouncing back and being able to come out of there with a win. But I expected a lot sharper performance. I mean, they had some flashes in the first half. You know, we see them get to the red zone, and I thought, just punch it in. Like, you're eight yards away. This is a good chance. You can go get seven here. And they throw one of the worst interceptions I think I've ever seen in my entire life. I still don't know what Matthew Stafford was trying to do there. I don't know if he's trying to throw the ball away, which you probably are thinking that that was not the case. Otherwise, that's going in the second row of the stands. So don't know what he was trying to do there. That was terrible. I think Sean McVay should have run the ball. I mean, they were on the – eight or nine yard line first down they don't run it second down they don't run it getting a little bit frustrating there but you know i thought they were going to come out a little bit sharper but again kudos to them for at least bouncing back in the second half looking a lot better uh even with an injured quarterback right you're seeing him throw some really really nice passes there in the second half so um they could have looked like the seahawks you know who never really got it together Mm -hmm. and uh unfortunately for them you know it's tough when you don't have russell wilson out there but yeah, I did. I did think the Rams were going to be a little bit sharper, so that was a little disheartening to see. But second half, I guess it was a, a bit of a different story. They looked a lot better in that one. Yeah, it's all about how you finish in this league, not how you start. And we've seen good teams, you know, specifically. We also covered the Chargers here, and for years they were a good starting team and couldn't finish. And that there's, I think that's more frustrating than starting slow but finishing with the win. Um, but yeah, that Stafford throw that was pretty reminiscent of Jared Goff's throw last year against the Seahawks. Where same thing, they're rolling out to the right in the red zone and just throw it up to the Seahawks. I, I watched the play over and over last night, and he had uh, you know, an undercut receiver, and then he had someone crossing over. But still, I don't know what he was doing. I, I still don't know. Um, and when you just said that, it kind of reminded me. This is eerie. I was thinking about it last night. That throw, the interception, was very similar to the Jared Goff throw, which was also an interception. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. And then I was thinking about it yesterday, too. The throw to Deshaun Jackson down the right sideline where he's like, yeah. you know, where he has to work back to the football and catch it and then goes like for 68 yards. That was really similar to the Cooper Cup throw as well, where yep. Cooper Cup was underthrown in the playoff game and he has to go back and catch it over Jamal Adams. So I was like, man, this is mm. strange. I don't know what's going on, but there's a lot of really similar type throws here in this game from Jared Goff last time they played Seattle to now with Matthew Stafford. Yeah, I guess the 12th man having their their way with the football or something there. But uh, speaking of the running game, that was kind of I feel like that was a talk all week about, you know, I've been talking about it for three years now, but it was a talk all week in, in relation on Twitter about how, you know, running, not running the football, abandoning the run, throwing it seven times in a row against Arizona when the run was working. And, you know, I've said it's kind of at this point, I love Sean McVay. I think he's one of the best coaches in the game that will, won't sway from just this, but we, we know what he is, what he is five years now mm-hmm. in the league. Like he wants to pass the football and use the run to compliment it, but he's not going to be a running smash mouth football coach. It's just not who he is. So I think fans that think that need to get through their heads. Unfortunately, that that's not going to happen. However, as you mentioned in the red zone, not running it once, do you think that'll ever change? Or like I said, is this what we're expecting? If they can get to 20 rushes a game, that's going to be a high point, I think, for these Rams. Yeah, I think you you hit the nail on the head there. He is what he is, right? Uh, it's like asking a, a Tiger to change his stripes. I, I just don't think it's going to happen. And it, it's hard for me to knock it, too, right? Because, yeah. and I heard someone say it yesterday on a Twitter space, he said, I don't care about balance, and neither do I. Just do what works, right? If yeah. you got to throw the ball 85 times in a game and you're coming out of the game with a 50-point victory, that's fine with me. Go ahead and do that. So, I got no issues with it. I know it's kind of nitpicky when, you know, they don't perform well and it's easy for us to say, oh, you should have run the ball more. But Mm -hmm. the one thing I definitely want to see out of him is just a better job at adjusting in terms of knowing what's working and not, right? So you look, like you mentioned at that Arizona game, they didn't stop you once when you were running the ball. Why would you stop, right? Like you got to just understand sometimes you got to put your ego aside or put, you know, what you wanted aside and just call what's working. And so 
I think it kind of seen, you know, we seen it come up yesterday in that Seattle game where there was the drive with Sony Michelle, right? And they, I think mm-hmm. they ran the ball like seven straight times or something. They got all the way down the field with these runs. So that was really impressive. I would like that as well. Um, and I think they just ran the ball a little bit more in this game. I want to say maybe like 20, 25 times. So, you know, it was better to see. But I think, uh, like you said, you know, we can never really expect this guy to just st- suddenly want to run the ball 25, 30, 35 times a game. Just don't think that's in his wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah, they got uh, 28 rushes, and I feel like last year that sweet spot was 30. If they got over 30, they won like every single game. So mm-hmm. uh, it does work w- whether he wants to or not. And I think what it what it does, and everyone talks about, well, you know, it opens up the play action, this and that. But I think in reality, and Brandon, St- I'm kind of stealing from Brandon Staley, who I'm sure everyone heard his press conference this week because it went like viral all over radio and Twitter. But they said, no, it, it more so I like it because it just forces the defense to tackle. Like it, it forces mm-hmm. a physicality on the game and keeps it honest because – when you throw the ball all the time, it's not forcing the defense to always tackle because you have incompletions, you have guys that go out of bounds, you have this. So it it adds a physicality and it can start to wear down the defense. And then, yeah, it does open up the play action, do stuff like that. So I think if they can get to that 25 spot mark every game, even if they're getting three yards a clip or 2.8 yards a clip, so the efficiency is not there, it just keeps the defense honest, keeps them tackling, wears them down a little bit. And then we see a second half, like we saw where things start opening up and we see a guy like, Bobby Trees, Robert Woods, get involved finally. How great was that to see for you? And I don't think – I was never concerned. I think it's just when you have an embarrassment of riches like the Rams have, one guy's going to knock it fed for a few weeks, and that happened to be Trees. But how good was it to see him involved? What did he go for, like 10 for 152 or something? It was yeah. great. Yeah, it was awesome to see. I mean, just because this guy is so lovable. I mean, everyone loves him. One of the most selfless players you're ever going to have on your team because you can tell behind the closed doors, I'm sure he was – um, like caping for some more plays, begging for some more plays. You're watching all your teammates, Deshaun Jackson, run for you know 75 yards a pop down the field. You're watching Cooper Cup, 12 catches a game. You got to want in on that, right? But at the same time, he's never going to make it a public scene. He's never going to say anything about it. And I think he came out yesterday where he said, you know, I went behind closed doors and talked to Sean McVay and was like, "How? what else can I do to get more involved in this offense? Instead of saying, give me the ball, he said, what can I do? I mean, that's just exactly. incredible out of that guy. You got to love him. So, Love to see it. You know, this guy is also just a great player. You want the ball in his hands. And I think that we've seen it come up really early where you see some of those screen passes that were maybe going to other players in in past weeks. You've seen, you know, Tyler Haig beat Deshaun Jackson, catch some screens in the last few weeks. Now Mm -hmm. they're going to Robert Woods. You know, that's where I think the ball should be going. This guy, great after the catch, great hands. Um, And they still have that little lack of chemistry. I think they're still trying to work through. There was the one pass where it looked like it was going to be a run and Stafford quickly throws it out and Robert Woods it was early in the game. He's trying to like catch it. Yeah. He's juggling it, catches it for a first down. So, mm-hmm. you know, still working out some of those kinks, I think, but man, it was great to see. And it kind of felt like one of those throwback Rams performances where you just got Robert Woods and Cooper cup running wide open all over the mm-hmm. Seahawks. It felt like, you know, like 2018 or something like that. So um, great for him, you know, personally, I think he deserves it, but at the same time, a great player, you definitely want that guy involved as much as you can in your offense going forward. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I love it from a, you know, just a respect standpoint and you can see how much McVeigh and Stafford respect him. Cause like you said, he's not a prima Donna. He's not your classic TO or one of these receivers that, you know, feed me. Like I'm the, I'm the star of the team. I'm the guy making plays goes and asks, what can I do? And then there's that respect there where it's not just, it's not all talk, right? Like, okay, we'll give you the ball 10 times now. Like we're going to, yeah. we're going to, we're going to target you 12 times in this game and get you the rock because we respect you as a person, as a captain and as a player. So you love seeing that ends up being the highest graded um, PFF offensive player with a 87 grade. I believe I saw um, who else on offense before we get to the defense though. So were you, uh, I guess impressed by, I think there was some good offensive line play here and there. We talked about Stafford having some struggles or whatnot, the running game, but who else besides Woods where you're like, yeah, that guy, I think that guy had a really solid game. I know, you know, the PFF numbers. So, so break it down for us. Who were some guys that impressed you? Yeah. So like you said, the offensive line, I think you got to give these guys their roses, man. They've been so good this season. And I was one of the people that was highly concerned about this unit going into the season. I genuinely was not to say that they were going to be one of the worst in the NFL, but mm-hmm. they had question marks, like legitimate question marks. And through five weeks, even last night, they've just been outstanding. I mean, so good. You see so many of those third and tens where Matthew Stafford feels comfortable in the pocket. He doesn't have to go anywhere on third and long. You know, they're going to throw the football and yet they're still giving him clean pockets to work in. And that's when a lot of these big plays happen. You've seen the Deshaun Jackson 68 yard pass happened on third and long so great mm-hmm. job by those guys i think it all starts with them not to mention the run blocking was outstanding there was some yeah. huge holes in that game 
And then the other guys that were part of that, the running backs, you know, and I don't even want to single them out as rushers. We all see it. Uh, it's not hard to watch a guy run the ball when he's got the ball in his hands. That's where your eyes are naturally going to go. Their pass protection. I mean, it was outstanding. Sony Michelle, Daryl Henderson, so good. I don't know what got into these guys last night. They mm -hmm. both had at least one or two reps each that were just outstanding in pass pro. So those are some of the things that allow Matthew Stafford to feel comfortable in the pocket, give him the time to look downfield, find guys like Robert Woods, you know, 20 yards down the field in those longer developing plays. So um, just a huge job really by all of the offense, but especially, you know, the running back unit, uh, the O-line. I thought they worked so well in tandem last night. All right, we'll be right back with more of this great interview with Sosa. Stay tuned. This is the L.A. Football Show. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to the L.A. Football Show. I am your host, Ryan Dyrud, and we are in the midst of a great conversation with my man Sosa Kremen, just talking about this huge Rams win and what implications it has on the NFC West and the NFC as a whole, how this defense can rebound and continue to build towards becoming the dominant defense it was just a year ago. Here we are continuing our conversation with Sosa. When Sony Michelle was, was traded to us, to the Rams, I, myself included, like everyone thought of, okay, this is a guy that can flash. Like we remember the gash plays in Georgia, you know, playing in the Rose Bowl against Oklahoma and a guy that can take over. I don't think anyone, myself included, realized how good he is in pass blocking. I mean, we saw the plays mm -hmm. against Tampa with his putting guys end over end, but he is solid. How much of a surprise are you or were you that he's that good in pass broke? That's something I did just did not realize. Yeah, I'm surprised too. Not like you said, not to say that we didn't think he was good in that regard. I just mm -hmm. didn't really know. You know, you never really know until you see it. And uh, maybe we should expect it more because he's a big stocky dude. Like this yeah. is not a small player uh, by any means. He's like 5'11", 215, like really filled out. So um, and of course, that doesn't really matter if you're not willing to block. And he clearly is willing to block. So. Uh, I think you got to give it up to both those guys, man, because that takes a lot of heart and you know, you're probably going to eat a big lick sometimes. Um, but at the same time, man, they're willing to do it and you got to give them a lot of respect for that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, looking at the defense quickly, Sosa, you know, obviously a contentious talk topic among Rams fans, basically since week one, you know, the, the regression, if you want to call it that everyone pining, missing Brandon Staley and whatnot. And, you know, I said last week on my show or a few days ago on my show that, you know, we should have maybe been more, realistic with the expectations of this defense you lose some key starters with troy hill and uh, john johnson and michael brockers and morgan fox and among others you lose not only your d coordinator but other pieces on the coaching staff with aubrey pleasant going you bring in a guy in raheem Morris that has never run this scheme so he's teaching himself on the fly i think the expectations we just set for too high but obviously a game like last week that was the low of low like that's something that it shouldn't have regressed that much this week still you know, some, giving up some plays, giving up some long drives, but they clamped down when they needed to. They get sacks when they needed to. They got turnovers when they needed to. The game stealing one by Nick Scott. But when you look on an individual level, and I'll throw out PFF stuff since you do work for PFF, and you can maybe tell us how subjective these grades are and if we should be concerned or if it's more of a play on play, not really worry about it. Because we look at specifically Jalen Ramsey and Darius Williams, who are the backbone outside of Aaron Donald of this defense and specifically the secondary. And respectively, finishing with a 55 and a 50, 50 grade, one of the lowest of this defensive unit. Should we be concerned or was it just specific plays that maybe drove that grade down? Yeah, it was probably just specific plays that drove the, the grade down. Like you said, um, it's always hard with the grade because uh, even I, who works there, I don't know 100 percent of the <laughs> formula in terms of, you know, how they're going to get dinged for certain plays and what's going to yeah. bring them up. Uh, so I typically like to look at the in-depth numbers instead. And, you know, n nobody really gets access to that except for the people that work there. But, you know, you look at some of the plays. I think Darius Williams allowed like 12 yards receiving yesterday, which is not yeah. much in a game, right? That's pretty good. You're going to take that. So um, and then you look at a guy like Robert Rochelle. I think he had the highest grade of all the guys in the secondary or amongst the corners, at least. It was like a 63 or something. And he was probably the worst corner on the field, right? I mean, he got toasted yeah. once, had to get a PI flag, toasted another time for a touchdown by DK Metcalf. So, you know, I'm looking more so at the in-depth numbers. Ramsey, probably not his best game. You know, he gave up one of those touchdowns to DK Metcalf. I don't know if that was his assignment or if he was supposed to get a little bit of inside help from Taylor Rapp, but uh, could have been, I guess, a little bit cleaner. But at the same time, when you have Russell Wilson and he's running around back there for six, seven, eight seconds, that's hard to cover. I mean, you got to give these guys a little bit of flack, I think, because in a regular game against a regular quarterback, 
a guy runs a route and when he's done running his route, that's the end of the play more often than not, as opposed to these guys that are going to run around for eight seconds back there. That falls more on the D line than it does on the secondary, in my opinion. So not a great game still. You know, I think anytime Geno Smith is driving 95 yards on you, you got to be concerned. Yeah. Uh, but like you said, I mean, it wasn't that many points, right? Like 17 points, 16 points, whatever. It's like, you, you would take that every time. So, you know, it's kind of hard to, to say, but in general, I thought the secondary was okay in this game at best. Yeah. And and you come from a game where you give up 37, can't stop anything. And then you have four days with no yeah. pads on to play another division rival on the road in a contentious environment. So I think everyone, well, you need to, you know, pump the brakes and say, okay, my biggest thing when I talked on Monday on my show was, as long as we see improvement, like we don't need to see all of a sudden them become the steel steel curtain from Sunday to Thursday. Like we just need to see improvement. I think we saw that, like you said, giving up 16 points, holding them when they needed to most, uh, getting sacks, getting picks. So the improvements there now we can, I think, I don't think we can truly judge Raheem Morris until like week, you know, 14, 15, when it's like, okay, now he's had plenty of time to get his feel, get his feet wet, calling the plays. And then we can decide, okay, this defense was a bust. But I think five weeks in, Still a work in progress. You still have your key players making plays when they need to. And uh, they're four and one. So before we wrap this up, so I got to talk about, you know, big man on campus, biggest guy there is, the best player in football, Aaron Donald, who gets the sack record for the Rams. And I do want to say this for those that don't know, because I saw a lot of people confused, like, well, doesn't Deacon Jones, doesn't uh, Jack Youngblood have like almost double that total? Sacks are not recorded as a total stat until 1982. So unfortunately, in the record books, their sacks don't count, even though we all know they are. But because of that, Aaron Donald, now the number one sack leader in franchise history. What would you think of that? How uh, big of a moment is that for him? And, you know, the dude probably still has 10 years to play. So I think he's going to get a lot more in that stat category. Yeah, I mean, it, it was so deserving, right? You're looking at the best player in football. Um Maybe one of the best, if not the best player in franchise history. I mean, he's that good. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds insane to say for a team that's had so much talent for so many years. You know, you look back through all the decades. Um, this guy is deserving of everything that comes his way. Like you mentioned, he's only 30 years old. Like, he's yeah. still got three or four years, I think, at his peak. Like, we're talking prime, prime Aaron Donald. So, who knows what he's going to end up with. I love to see it. every time you see a guy like that that puts in so much work get all these good things coming his way. I mean, it's perfectly deserved. So um, kind of fitting that it came against Russell Wilson because somehow against Seattle, this guy just turns it up a notch. Every time I talked about it before the game, uh, dug into some of the PFF numbers, pressured Russell Wilson 93 times in 14 games over the course of his entire career. That would have been the sixth most pressures in any given season since 2010. He pressured yeah. him that many times. It would have been the sixth best season ever from 2010 in terms of pressures. And that was in 14 games. So uh, really? it just was really fitting that he came against Seattle. I love to see it. Uh, the guy's a special player, special human, 30 years old. We got a lot of time left. I hope knock on yeah. wood, we get a lot more production there. So uh, we'll see how it goes. But man, such a deserving honor, uh, a special player, special human being. Absolutely. Huge and, and great to see. And like you said, great to see against Seattle. It's always good to break a record against a, a division foe. So Rams get the much needed win, a sigh of relief for Rams fans in Seattle, move to four and one. Like you said, the, the short somewhat bye week now with 10 days until their next game. So Sosa Cremendez, host of Locked On Rams, also fantasy writer for Pro Football Focus. My man, always a pleasure, dude. Great seeing you. Thanks so much. Of course. Thanks uh, for having me, my, my friend. And hopefully we can uh, have a few more of these uh, a couple wins coming uh, soon here. Uh, get a little break, you know, but uh, we'll be back soon. And uh, hopefully the Rams can string uh, a few more wins together here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll do plenty more. You can all find him at QB's MVP on Twitter. Great follow. Make sure to check him out. So take care, my man. All right. We'll talk to you soon. There you go. It's Big Sos, my man. Locked on Rams. Pro football focus. Hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. Hope you enjoyed that Rams win. I know I sure did. You know, like I like we said, it, it was ugly, but wins a win, man. Rams are four and one. They get ten days off now. Really sure things up. You come off a bad loss. You have four days to fix it, and you do. You take that and you get out of dodge. I don't. You don't need to be overcritical right now. You had four days to fix the debacle that happened against Arizona. Not all was fixed but they got a win against a tough division foe and they moved to four and one. The road gets easier now. Potentially we can see this team be eight and one at their bye. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but that's what the schedule dictates. They are better on paper. They have better talent, better coaching, 
That's a potential possibility. Eight and one. But hey, we'll see good football. We'll talk about it these 10 days and see what they can get to. This Chargers team, man, let's get into it. Brandon Staley, what he's done with this team, it's been talked about all week. I know there's that viral video of him talking about what the running game means and everyone's just loving it. You know, he's the talk of the town, talk of the league, talk of the nation. Hold you guys. If you've been listening to the LA Football Show, you know how what I feel about this Brandon Staley. I knew he'd be a great head coach. And we're four weeks in. Stuff can change. I don't think it will. Because not only is he a smart guy, but as I said all offseason when he was hired, this is a guy about relationships. And that's what's so important in coaching. Relationships. Bill Belichick, one of the greatest coaches of all time. Not one, probably the greatest coach of all time. Up there for sure. I've never met him, so I and I know players have said he's a little bit different in locker rooms. But there's also a lot of players that have left New England and said, man, it just wasn't fun playing there. We, we went there because we knew we could win. We bought into the system, but it wasn't fun. Like, you know, Bill coached and did this and that. And again, I'm not saying anything bad about Belichick, Belichick you know, the GOAT probably. But nowadays coaching, you have to not just be smart and no X's and O's. You have to be able to relate to your players. And that's how you get more out of them. We hear these, uh, you know, players coach, or we hear these like X's and O coach. Brandon Staley is both. Sean McVay is both. These guys that know the game of football schematically inside and out, both sides, tell you exactly what you need to do in order to win. But then also ask you about your family. Invite you over to dinner. Get to know you on a personal level. That's not just important for football. It's important for life. Any boss you have, I don't know if players consider their coach a boss. I know that it's like the GM and the owner is probably more the boss. But a coach is more of a, on a leadership level, any leader you have, you can lead with knowledge. You can lead with, you know, knowing where your company, your team, your relationship needs to end up, your end goal. But you also have to lead and build a trust. And you do that by building relationships. And that's what Brandon Staley has done so far for this Chargers team. And you see it. It's infectious. Like he talks in his press conferences and everyone's just fired up. Media, everyone listening. The players, you can tell, are fired up. And they're winning because of it. Winning and losing in the NFL is so granule. There's so many things that go into a win. One tiny, you know, you hear it all the time. It's a game of inches. You know, any given Sunday. The great Al Pacino film has that great speech. One inch this way, one inch, you know, a great speech that anyone that played high school football probably heard a thousand times in the locker room before rivalry games. But it's true. We saw last year with the Chargers being led by Anthony Lynn, no disrespect, great human being, but they were losing the game of inches. Little mistakes cost them five six ball games. And so this new coaching staff comes and before the season, I was like, yeah, good hire for the nationally, at least good hire. Seems like a good guy. We don't know a ton about him, um, but this team, you know, I think they will be better. They got the, they got the quarterback of the future. They're probably a couple years away. This team was seven and nine last year with some really bad coaching blunders, some really bad mistakes. Let's not let the players off hook too. some bad execution and a lot of injuries. This team can compete now. Right now. And we're seeing that. 3-1. and one, Some big wins. Everyone's shocked. I'm not shocked. Not all shocked. You hear Brandon Staley's after his, his uh, post-game victory speeches? First thing he says every time. Are we surprised by this? I'm not either. Because we know how talented this team is. Every year this Chargers team is talented on paper. They just never produce or they never can stay healthy. Well, now they're finally producing, and they're finally staying healthy. And that comes down to coaching. And then execution by the players executing the game plan. Now, this week, the Cleveland Browns, who are on paper, probably, in my opinion, the best team in the NFL on paper. I mean, they are stacked, loaded at every position. You go down their roster, and you're like, their worst player might be Baker Mayfield. And that's not disrespecting the hand. That's just how good this team is and how talented they are at every position. Receivers stacked. And OBJ isn't even the OBJ of old. Like he's like a mid tier receiver at this point. You know, been had some injuries as well. So that's to blame. But you still have OBJ and Jarvis Landry. You have the number two and the number 13 running back in terms of yards, rushing yards in Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. 
I mean, is there a better one-two punch than that? There's some really good one-two punches in this league. Is it better than Chubb and Kareem Hunt? Offensive line. Finally, they built a good offensive line with some great bookend pieces. Done some good drafting. Look at the defense. I mean, loaded every position. You have Miles Garrett, arguably the best pass rusher in the game. Top three, probably for sure. You could say him, Joey Bosa. Uh, I mean, if I, I always, I always consider Aaron Donald different because he's a unicorn. You know, he's I know he's a pass rusher, but he comes from the inside, so I, I keep him separate from edge players. Because I put Aaron Donald one no matter what. So let me just get that out there. He's number one no matter what. When you look at just edge, you got Bosa, you got Garrett, Khalil Mack, Von Miller, T.J. Watt, Chandler Jones. I mean, those are like the top. Top and then argue. Who do you want to put at the top? They're all fantastic. You all have to game plan around them. They got great backers. They're great on the back end. You know, they got two former Rams and Troy Hill, John Johnson. Obviously, they got Ward they drafted early. They're just loaded. And they've been performing too. I mean, their one loss is to the Kansas City Chief in Kansas City week one. They're graded out by PFF as the number one overall offensive team and the number two overall defensive team. PFF, I talk all the time, is very subjective. Even if you heard my conversation with Sosa right now, he works for PFF, and he even says he doesn't really know how they truly grade, what goes into it. But it's still it's a good model to base off of. And Cleveland is basically, you put that together, one, two. They are the number one overall graded team in the NFL. So this is going to be a tough, tough test, and it's... I feel like everyone's talked all, you know, a few weeks. It's like, okay, Casey's the team to beat. And then Vegas comes to town. It's like, well, it's a division rivalry. Vegas is 3-0, the number one offense in the league currently. They're the team to beat. Dallas Cowboys, tough loss, last second walk-off field goal. Barely lost it. And it was like, man, bad loss. But now we see how good Dallas is. We're like, it's not that bad of a loss anymore. <laughs> At the game, they should have won. The Chargers be 4-0 against three prolific teams. Three prolific offenses. Well, now, statistically, the best team of all those is coming to town in the Cleveland Browns. So if the Chargers can get out of this game with the win, and they go to 4-1, and one, again, it's early, but I say it all the time, we only know what we know. And what we would know through five games is the Chargers have beaten, by all accounts, four of the top probably ten teams in the NFL. Maybe that means the Chargers are a top three team in the NFL right now. I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We got to play the game, but that's just me looking out. And how are they going to do that? One, which is going to be a tall order, is stopping the run. Going into the Vegas game, the car- the Chargers were the worst ranked rush defense, giving up 170 yards per game. When Staley was with the Rams, they finished third, number one overall defense, third against the run. I knew it would get better. It's going to take time for these guys to get in the system. You're going from a cover three, four, three base to all of a sudden a two high safety, three, four base that runs very, very differently than even a three, four base. Cause they run out of the base. They run their base like 15% of the time. So you're running a very different defense. The guys are going to take time. Wasn't necessarily his players that he drafted in there. Justin Jones, who's probably the chargers best run defender on the defensive line has been hurt. Just went on the IR. But then against the Raiders, buckle down. What do you give up? 48 yards? A little different animal coming to town with Nick Chubb and Creep Hunt. But if they can at least stop the bleeding, not give up gash plays, I like their chances. So that's going to be a big storyline to look at there, is how the Chargers do against this run. How the linebackers do. Kaiser White's been great. Drew Tranquil played phenomenal last week. How they do against the run. If they cheat up with the secondary, cheat Jerwin James into the box to help out. You want to force Baker Mayfield to beat you. I'm higher on Baker than probably most analysts and media personnel. I think Baker can play and can beat you, but you want to force him to beat you, not let Nick Chubb and Kareem Hum beat you. They can do that. I like this Chargers matchup. Other one to watch, Rashawn Slater, who right now, in my opinion, is the rookie of the year. I don't think an offensive lineman has ever won it, but what he's done against the pass rushers he's faced, phenomenal. It's phenomenal. The dude is looking like an all-pro left tackle 
and he's played four NFL games in his career and had all last year off because Northwestern did not play due to COVID. And now he gets to go up against Miles Garrett. If he can shut down Miles Garrett, give him the rookie of the year right now. Back to back Chargers rookie of the year. Justin Herbert, Rashawn Slater. Can't wait to watch that matchup. It's going to be a great game, guys. I cannot wait to see how it goes. I'm going to take the Chargers. I think they're riding that momentum. Brandon Staley just has these guys ready. They've gotten better week in and week out. Improved every single week. So I'm going to take the Chargers in this one over the Browns. Should be a great game. We'll have a lot of people from the LA Football Network there. I think we literally have like six people going to be there. So make sure to follow at LAFB Network for this one um, for all your coverage of it. USC, like I said, welcomes Utah. We have two people at that game as well. One in the press box, one is a fan. So make sure to follow LFB Network. Uh, Utah's looked very shaky this year, but so is USC. But USC is coming off a big win against Colorado. So I like USC in this one to uh, ride that momentum. And I think Dante Williams is starting to get his culture ingrained in these players. You know, going into now, I believe his third, what is this, his fourth game. This is going into his fourth game. Two, two and one as a head coach so far. I think he's starting to get his culture ingrained, and we're going to start seeing it more. And if they can win, you know, moving to four and two, season very much alive still for this USC team. I know the college football playoff not happening. I know it's disappointing. It sucks. Pac-12 game, Rose Bowl, that's not a lost season. That's still success. It's exactly what we wanted to see UCLA do as well. They need to go down to Tucson and boat race the University of Arizona. They need to win by 40. Let's see. I want to see a Hawaii score in that game because Hawaii is a better team than Arizona right now. So let's see them go down, boat race them, and then they get back on track as well. Also four and two. I said it all along. The Pac-12 South, in my opinion, is going to come down to that USC-UCLA game at the end of the year. Whoever wins that game will win the Pac-12 South. I know right now you have Arizona State at the top, but I think they'll blunder some games like they always do. And it's going to come down to that one. Can't wait. Got a great weekend of football, guys. I need more time. On this show, hit me up tonight. Any more time? Because I could just, I could just keep going, keep going. But I appreciate you all for tuning in every single week. This is the LA Football Show. I'm your host Ryan Dyard. Let's go four and zero on the weekend. LA Football, big Rams win. Let's see our Charges, Bruins, and Trojans uh, counter and have some big wins themselves. Enjoy, everyone. We'll talk to you next week. Make sure to check out lafbnetwork.com. All of our articles, all of our podcasts, all of our shows up there. Follow me at Ryan Dart LFB. Enjoy. Peace.